Hello, good afternoon everyone, or good morning depending on what coast you're on. My name is Bree Morris and I'm the Senior Director of Program Development um, here at the National Community Pharmacist Association and I also lead our Long-Term Care Division. On behalf of NCPA and ASCP, the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, I'd like to welcome you to today's education webinar, USP General Chapter 800 and EPA, Implications for Long-Term Care and Community Pharmacies. Today, the speakers for today are ASCP members um, Dana Saffel and Paul Baldwin. Dana is the President of PharmaCare Strategies in Florida, and Paul is principal of Baldwin Health Policy Group in Pennsylvania. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be provided on both NCPA and ASCP's website. The program will also be available for Home Study CE, so if you find value in this session, please encourage your colleagues to listen online at a later date. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Dana um, to, to get us started. Terrific. Well, thank you for joining us for a very short discussion on a very important topic that will be impacting the way we practice pharmacy in community and long-term care settings as well as hospital settings over the next year. First thing is USP has been around forever. They are the organization that is recognized by the United States CMS uh, as setting standards for medications and food handling. Uh, they have thousands of chapters that address this, looking specifically at identity, strength, quality, and purity of medications and foods, et cetera. However, they have had a lot of activity in three particular chapters over the last 10 years. Chapter 795, which has to do with non-sterile compounding, Chapter 797, which has to do with sterile compounding, and Chapter 800, which has to do with handling of hazardous drugs. All three of these chapters have gone through multiple iterations and public comment periods over the last five years, and all three of them are now published in final version and will be effective December 1st of 2019. So we have just a little over six months to be prepared, or a little less than six months to be prepared to implement these. Now the purpose of USP 800, which is the hazardous drug handling, is that it expands upon information that was mentioned in chapters 795 and 797. And essentially what they've done is take all discussion of handling hazardous drugs during the compounding process and moved that all to chapter 800. So the 795 and 797 now just simply refer you to chapter 800 for following procedures with hazardous drugs. But 800 extends way beyond just compounding, and now it has to do with everything in the pharmacy, including storage of hazardous drugs, uh, handling them for packaging, uh, and then distribution and administration to the patient if that's done in a healthcare setting. The philosophy is that there is no acceptable level of exposure to hazardous drugs, and the focus is on containment. So what USP 800 does is attempt to describe practice and quality standards for handling hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. Now, this impacts everybody that works in a healthcare setting. However, if you are in a community setting, it only impacts your activities in your pharmacy. Once you have handed that patient uh, the prescription of a hazardous drug to a patient, they are not required in their own homes to comply with USP 800. So it's only impacting healthcare practitioners in healthcare settings. What is a hazardous drug? Well, under USP 800, it's defined as any drug that is listed on the NIOSH list. The NIOSH list is a list that has been uh, maintained by CDC, Centers for Disease Control, for uh, at least a decade. The most recent published version of the NIOSH list is from 2016, and there's a link at the bottom of this slide if you want to go directly to the site, or you can just go to cdc.gov and put in the search term NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H, and you will find that CDC has an updated list that they intend to publish this month. 
they're not taking any medications off of the list that was uh, published in 2016. Uh, they had made a couple of adjustments in the last two years that are published on the site. Nothing else is coming off the list. They're going to add a bunch of new stuff, most of which it is monoclonal antibody drugs. But good to take a look at this list because this is the meat of implementing a USP 800 compliant program in your pharmacy or your healthcare setting. Basically, the NIOSH list categorizes uh, hazardous drugs into one of three groups. Antineoplastics go into group one, non-antineoplastics are in group two, and then drugs that simply have a reproductive risk are in group three. And the way they arrive at putting the drugs into these categories and placing them on the list is looking at, and primarily based off package insert material, any listing of carcinogenicity, teratogenicity or developmental toxicity, reproductive toxicity in humans, organ toxicity at low doses, genotoxicity, or if there's any new drug that mimics the existing hazardous drug in structure or toxicity, it automatically gets handed. So now we've got this list of three categories of drugs, and depending on the category that the drug falls into, will guide us into what level we need to apply our hazardous drug policies. So every different category of drug, of hazardous drugs, has um, a set amount of personal protective equipment that must be used. And if you are actually compounding that drug, a set standard for whether that compounding needs to take place in a primary or a primary and secondary containment system. It says um, very clearly that any antineoplastic drug requiring manipulation, so this would be a chemotherapy that you have to admix before it can be administered to the patient, must follow every standard in the USP 800 chapter. And any active pharmaceutical ingredient, basically the powder that they start with uh, to make a drug, any active pharmaceutical ingredient of a hazardous drug would also have to be handled according to all the standards in the USP chapter. But drugs outside of those, so the drugs that were simply a reproductive risk or drugs that were non-antineoplastic, those allow the facility some degree of flexibility in determining how they want to handle those drugs. Uh, specifically, the chapter reads that final dosage forms of compounded hazardous drug preparations or conventionally manufactured hazardous drug pro products that do not require any further manipulation other than counting or repackaging may not have to follow all of the requirements. The way that you determine that is by doing facility-level risk assessments, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And I've got to advance. So what I did, this is an extensive list of drugs. If you were to look at the entire NIOSH list, a significant amount of them are chemotherapy drugs, which most of us in standard community practice and long-term care do not encounter. I went through the list and went through Category 1, Category 2, and Category 3 and pulled out the drugs that I thought we most commonly encountered in long-term care and because that is my area of expertise but I suspect they're also commonly encountered in the community care setting. And then I attempted to prioritize them by the ones that we use the most. And you can see the ones that, you, that I believe we use the most in long-term care at the top of the list and in orange. So for the antineoplastic drugs, and remember these are the drugs that handling these drugs will require full protective gear would be methotrexate, tamoxifen, anastrozole, magesterol, hydroxyurea, and letrozole. Now, hydroxyurea, I just realized I didn't pronounce it correctly, forgive me. You can read down the group of uh, group two drugs and you'll see even more commonly used drugs like carbamazepine. Carbamazepine is a drug that's considered a hazardous drug due to reproductive toxicity. Uh, Residuline, spironolactone, we use those drugs very frequently in our geriatric population. Oxcarbazepine, another sodium block, blocker uh, anti-epileptic drug. You'll see a number of the sodium blocking anti-epileptic drugs, in, as a matter of fact, 
amongst group two and group three. And all of the estrogens and progesterones, because they have a risk of reproductive uh, toxicity if they are absorbed through the skin or swallowed uh, during the time that someone is pregnant. So there are reasons why all of these drugs are on these lists, and I'm sure most of y'all are sitting there trying to remember how many times you've actually handled these drugs over the course of your career without any concern whatsoever about them being a hazardous drug. So this is a kind of a new concept that we're going to have to start implementing into our, our practice settings. You can go through the list on your own and come up with the drugs that are specifically used in your facility. And as a matter of fact, that is one of your requirements, to go through the list of NIOSH drugs, come up with a printed list that is documented of the compounds that are handled or utilized in your pharmacy or your facility, and then perform the risk assessment on each of those drugs. Now, as we mentioned, there is a requirement in USP 800 to have an occupational safety plan. So you've got to have that list. That list has to be updated every time that there is a new drug that comes on the market that may be considered a hazardous drug. And then the entire list has to be updated annually. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of different ways to determine what is a hazardous drug. Well, the NIOSH list is the first great place to start. But if there is a new drug that comes on the market that is not yet added to the NIOSH list, then your facility would need to go through or your pharmacy committee would need to go through and determine whether it was designated as an antineoplastic agent whether the manufacturer suggests special isolation or other handling um, or disposal requirements, uh, whether it is a known human mutagen, carcinogen, teratogen, or reproductive toxicant, all of which is generally listed under Section 16 in the package insert. So you'll have to do this research yourself on any new drug that gets introduced to the market and that is handled by your pharmacy. The other thing that you have to do is you have to um, assign a person, designate a person formally in charge of the hazard drug pro program. And that hazardous drug program uh, person then is required for overseeing the development and compliance with policies and procedures that you develop and also competency of personnel. So there are a variety of competency requirements spelled out for our compounding, both sterile and non-sterile, they would need to also be measured that they were donning the appropriate personal protective equipment and that they were handling a hazardous drug in an appropriate manner, labeling it appropriately, had appropriate spill, cleanup, uh, materials in place, et cetera. All of that would need to be uh, documented for competency on the personnel that handled hazardous drugs in your organization. And also, depending on whether or not you're just simply opening a bottle and counting it into an amber bottle to give to a patient, uh, or whether or not you're actively splitting, crushing, or otherwise compounding, you may need to have access to uh, containment systems. Now, all of that sounds pretty complicated, and you're probably going, wow, I've got to get a lot done between now and December 1st. But the reality is the United States Pharmacopeia is simply a standard setting organization. It does not have compliance or enforcement authority. So, we're in a kind of unique situation in that the enforcement agent for pharmacies is the Board of Pharmacies in each of the 50 states. And each Board of Pharmacy will have to designate through its rulemaking uh, process whether or not it's going to require pharmacies to comply with some or all of the standards of USP 800. And we know that it took a very long time for state boards of pharmacies to adopt uh, USP 797 on sterile compounding. And in fact, there's still four states that have not formally adopted USP 797. Some of the states have adopted part of the language, but not all of the language. And so we expect to see some similar uptake with uh, pharmacy board enforcement of USP 800. Um, when I first began investigating this back in November, as of that time, only four states had actually stated that they were going to require compliance with USP 800. Uh, one state had said that they were not going to do USP 800, and the rest of the states were in flux. Uh, if, 
if I were uh, – what I am doing, I'm in the state of Florida when I get to be home. I watch the Florida Board of Pharmacies activities every single month to see if they are making a decision on how much or all of USP 800 is going to be enforced. So even though the standard becomes officially effective December 1st of 2019, your State Board of Pharmacy may be well into next year or the year after before they make that decision. Or they could make a decision between now and December, and you'll need to have everything in place. And your Board of Pharmacy, I highly recommend that you stay in touch with them. But even if your Board of Pharmacy is not mandating compliance with USP 800, if you do any compounding, there is a federal enforcement. The Drug Quality and Security Act requires compounding pharmacies to comply with USP 795 and 797 in order to avoid having to file a new drug application on your compound. And 797 and 795 require compliance with 800. So if you are a compounding pharmacy, you're going to be mandated by default from the federal requirement for compounding pharmacies, if that makes sense. So if you compound, get ready for 800 by December 1st. If, you don't comp if you're not a compounding pharmacy, you may have some leniency according to your boards of pharmacies. So I've mentioned already the key enforcement uh, points for pharmacies. It's really dependent on your board of pharmacy unless you are a compounding pharmacy with federal requirements. But even if you don't, uh, particularly in the long-term care setting or if you're a retail setting and you uh, service hospices, for instance, who are also uh, impacted, the, even though you may choose not to implement hazardous drug handling in your pharmacy, some of your customers may be required to implement hazardous drug handling. And if you provide consulting services to nursing homes under your requirement as a consultant, to the nursing home where you have to advise the facility on receiving, storing, dispensing, packaging, labeling, administering, using, and disposing of all medications, you have a uh, nursing home compliance obligation to be telling your nursing homes about USP 800. So it's up to you if you want to do it in the pharmacy, but you're going to have to educate your facilities because they are likely to be required to do it. Now, Again, the enforcement for nursing homes to have, or any other healthcare setting, uh, to have to comply with USP 800 will be by their uh, licensing board, which would be the state nursing home licensing board in your state, or CMS uh, could require uh, compliance with USP 800. And CMS already does by default in the language under medication administration. So those of you that work at all in long-term care, uh, you'll, you'll notice under F759, uh, Medication Administration, that it says the nurses must administer medications according to current commonly accepted health standards established by national organizations, boards, and councils. Well, USP would be such an organization. So once this becomes effective, a uh, savvy surveyor could hold a nursing home responsible for being compliant with hazardous drug handling because of this provision under medication administration. But even before CMS gets wind of this, it's very likely that liability carriers are going to require it. Because if you imagine having hazardous drugs in your pharmacy and having a pregnant technician and who doesn't understand hazardous drugs and is handling them with their bare hands or is breathing in the dust from counting tablets or crushing tablets or cutting them in half, and then ends up with a fetal malformation or deformity, uh, the pharmacy is at risk for being sued now that there are these published standards for protection against hazardous drugs. So you may find your pharmacy liability insurance or the nursing home may find their liability insurance being dependent on compliant with this standard. So there'll be a lot of pressure coming around on uh, compliance with protecting our, our patients and our employees from exposure. So this is all the different kind of exposure that we encounter in long-term care. I just broke it out by receipt, dispensing, compounding, and other manipulations, administration, patient care activities, spills, transport, and waste. 
And what I did here was if it significantly impacts the pharmacy staff, I put it in blue. And if it is likely to impact both the pharmacy staff and the nursing staff, I put it in orange. So you can see, and I mean, really and truly, all of this has a chance to impact somebody. But counting and repackaging of tablets and capsules, while primarily being something that impacts the pharmacy staff, may be a very low risk of exposure if you never manipulate the tablet or the capsule. It's in solid form. And your staff never touch the products with their hand. So you're not generating particulate matter. You're not making dust that could be inhaled or that could drop on someone's skin. And you're not coming in direct contact with the tablet or capsule to allow the drug to transfer through the skin. So you may do a risk assessment and determine that 99% of what you do in your pharmacy does not expose your staff to hazardous drugs, and you may determine that you don't have to change anything in the way that you handle. That is a facility-to-facility-wide basis, unless it is an antineoplastic drug. And remember, methotrexate is an antineoplastic drug. Uh, there were several other common ones that you can see come across your counting tablet, uh, counting, tablet counting counter. Oh, excuse me. I need another cup of coffee. Um, so looking again, we've talked a little about who the personnel are that are exposed to the hazardous drug. This is everybody. Nobody is exempt. And the chapter actually specifically says uh, veterinarian offices. turns out that there was a lot of study. So I'll just let you know, this thing all came about from a study that was really performed two decades ago that looked at nurses in hospitals that administered chemotherapy. And they, they used standard protocol available in the hospital at the time, which was to wear one pair of gloves uh, when they administer IVs. And they measured the blood levels of the various uh, cytotoxic uh, antineoplastic agents. And they measured, very, uh, there were measurable blood levels. And the more the longer the nurses worked on the unit, the higher the blood levels got from just ambient absorption by splashes on the skin um, or inhaling aerosolized particles. And that's what became the driver for all of this. But one of the most um, compelling uh, stories that got sent to USP that drove this chapter development was from a veterinarian. So veterinarians are specifically identified as places where hazardous drugs need to be handled. And if you compound a lot of veterinarian products, and I know a lot of us are in these specialty niche niches, if you compound a hazardous drug for a veterinary product, you've got, to, you've got to label it and treat it and share this information to the veterinary uh, office so that they can implement hazardous drug procedures. So what is this protective personal equipment that we need to wear? Well, I like this chart, and it comes right out of Chapter 20. And by the way, if you want to go back and learn everything about USP 800, you can download the chapter free from the United States Pharmacopeia website. It's only about 20 pages long. Now, it's microscopic print, but it's only 20 pages long. It's a good hour read if you're on a plane or a train or, or uh, sitting in traffic. So you can become an expert. But basically, uh, for all types of hazardous drugs, for any receiving, unpacking, and placing in storage, you do not need to wear double chemotherapy gloves. Single gloves can be used unless spills are expected to occur. You do not have to put a protective gown on. You do not need eye and face protection. You do not need respiratory protection unless spills or leaks occur or are likely to occur. And no ventilated engineering control. So that's how you would read this chart. Uh, intact tablet, tablet or capsule, like what most of us deal with on our, you know, 90% of our day. Um, if the administration to the patient is from a unit dose package. Uh, there is no gloves needed, no gown, no face, or respiratory protection. Uh, for tablets and capsules that you are, when you are in the process of cutting, crushing, or manipulating the tablets or capsules, and oftentimes if somebody has a half-tab order, we cut that tablet in half at the pharmacy, uh, and sometimes we may package that into unit of use 
packaging or compliance packaging that does require manipulation with our hands, uh, then it's recommended that you have to double glove and wear a protective gown. You do not need face and eye protection, but you do need respiratory protection, which could just be a, a, a mask, just a, a fabric mask uh, to, protect, to prevent you from inhaling the dust. So as you go through this, now if you're administering it once the nurses get it, you don't need the single, you don't need double gloves. You can use single gloves, and you don't need a gown. You do need eye and face if there's potential for vomit or spit up, but you do not need respiratory protection. So this is the standard that USP set. Now you can do that facility level risk assessment to determine whether you need to meet these standards or whether you feel that your policies and procedures would require that you don't have to meet those standards. That's the critical element. If you do not do a risk assessment at all, then you have to follow all those standards. So I know I, I don't want to take up much time, much more of my time because Paul's information is very important and we want to leave time for Q&A. So let me just touch base on the last few of these slides, and I do hope that these will be available for download for you. And I know this is being recorded. You can listen again. Um, but select um, hazardous drug handling procedures. For dispensing, uh, counting and repacking equipment has to be dedicated for hazardous drug use. So if you've only had one count tray or one Kirby machine or one Euclid machine, you're going to have to get two or you're going to have to handle your hazardous drugs through a different type of machine. So hazardous drugs have to be handled with different packaging machines. If you just have counting trays on the, on the uh, uh, counter, then you would have a counting tray for non-hazardous drugs and a counting tray for hazardous drugs. And they should be cleaned. They, they really should be cleaned between every drug, but particularly with hazardous drugs, you have to decontaminate them before you count the next hazardous drug. Uh, if it's an anti-neoplastic hazardous drug, it cannot be placed in automated counting or packaging machines at all. And then once you package it, it has to be labeled as a hazardous drug. Most people use yellow hazardous, dr hazardous drugs uh, auxiliary labels, uh, or they put them on, on a Ziploc baggie that they put the hazardous drug in. So for transportation, again, you've got to have uh, all your hazardous drugs have to be identified for transportation for your driver or whoever is taking it over to the facility. And they, you have to have standard operating procedures on how you're going to mitigate the risk of a spill and what you're going to do if something were to spill. For administration, there has to be policies that hazardous drugs would not be manipulated um, if they are admit, manipulated then they have to go to donning the protective, personal protective equipment, such as the uh, plastic uh, gloves and masks and gown and all the things we just looked at on that previous slide. It could be that if you uh, have a facility, a nursing home that's crushing medications or if you're crushing them for some reason in the pharmacy, there are crushing devices that you slip the tablet into a um, PVC envelope, that envelope has been sealed. Uh, the crushing takes place within the envelope. The envelope could be opened with the powder then sprinkled away from the face into whatever it is you need to compound the, or the, crush the tablet for so that in your policies and procedure there would be no aerosolized particles and the risk would be very low. And you may determine that in certain situations with certain equipment, you would, not, you would do a safety risk assessment and you would not need to don all the personal protective equipment. But if you don't have all of that in place, then you have to follow the guidelines. Disposal is specific. Again, has to be handled properly. And I'm going to let Paul talk about that because that is where the EPA has stepped in with specific disposable, disposal requirements. A couple of other things that I want to bring to your attention before I turn it over to my colleague is looking at this risk assessment. Every single drug has to have that's on this hazardous drug list of drugs that you use in your facility has to have an individual risk assessment. You can't do it by class. You can't say, okay, all sodium channel blocking, antiepileptic drugs, this is the risk assessment. It has to be by individual drug. It has to be updated on an annual basis. It has to consider 
what category of hazardous drug are we talking about? What's the dosage form? How, um, what's the risk, what's the potential risk that that dosage form is going to allow particulate matter to become aerosolized where it can be absorbed into the employee's skin, either orally, nasally, mucous membrane, or through the skin, uh, or through the eyes. So we want to evaluate that, and then how much manipulation is required. And all of this must be documented as your thought process, along with whatever procedures your, your pharmacy or your facility may have in place to prohibit that. Um, the chapter actually goes on and says that repeated counting, cutting, or crushing tablet formulations of hazardous drugs should take place in a containment device such as a class two biological safety cabinet or aseptic uh, compounding containment isolator. But if the device is not available, which would be the situation for most pharmacies, most retail pharmacies for sure, uh, then the requirement, so this is for your technicians that are doing nothing but counting hazardous drugs uh, or cutting them in half or crushing them, they would have to have double gloves a protective gown, and respiratory protection, and a disposable plaid, pad to place on the work surface to protect the work surface. So that would be your standard in your retail pharmacy or in your long-term care pharmacy if you did not have a containment hood for those technicians that spend all day long packaging uh, because that's a current long-term exposure. Uh, it would also be prudent to change the gown and the gloves and the respiratory protection between different hazardous drugs, particularly if you're doing a large batch of packaging of one particular hazardous drug before you go to the next. This is just a sample uh, hazardous drug risk assessment form. And I will say that so far of all the pharmacy organizations, um, where, what I have found is that the College of Psychiatric and Neurological Pharmacists, I'm going to give them a plug, even though I'm an ASCP member and we're talking with uh, NCPA, but to accelerate things, they have done about 100-plus risk assessments on common psychiatric drugs, uh, which they sell. So I, I haven't looked at it yet because I haven't bought one yet. But you could go to that site. Um, I know for a fact that ASCP and NCPA is working on helping us, their members, uh, to have risk assessment guidance on many of the other NIOSH drugs that we encounter in our package, in our, uh, our um, practice. But I just wanted to throw that out. That might be somewhere to watch how somebody else did it. You might want to do it all yourself instead of buy theirs, or you may decide theirs isn't really appropriate but it's just a source you can take a look at because some of them have already been done. And with that, uh, I have a final list of things for pharmacies to consider when they assess for hazardous drug risk. First, of course, make that list of the drugs that are on the NIOSH list that you're having in your pharmacy or your facilities. Uh, check for risk of exposure, what would happen if uh, somebody actually, this is kind of like a failure modes and effects analysis. Essentially, what's the chance that somebody's going to be exposed to that drug if they are exposed? Are we going to know it and be able to do something about it if they are exposed and we don't know it? What's the likelihood something bad will happen? And start with those drugs first and get your risk assessment done uh, and then go on down the list and finish it. Uh, Develop a plan of action. Remember, you've got to assign someone, designate someone in your organization to be in charge of hazardous drugs. I would not make it the pharmacist in charge because they've got plenty enough on their plate. It could be a technician. If you have a high-level technician, it doesn't have to be a pharmacist, but it needs to be somebody that can take uh, an initiative here to get this in place in your organization. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Paul Baldwin, and he's going to take us through EPA, and we still should have a few minutes at the end for questions. All right. Thanks, Dana. And this is Paul, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Environmental Protection Agency's final rule for management of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals for healthcare facilities. Um, I really don't have anything to disclose. I aspire someday to be able to disclose honoraria far and wide, but not today. Okay, let's get started. I'm just going to give you the short history here of, and because context is everything in the, in the federal rulemaking and in other areas, 
EPA started about 10 years ago or longer uh, to look at specifically this whole issue of managing hazardous waste in healthcare settings. And the, the reason this became a problem is because healthcare facilities continued to ask EPA, you know, what are we, are, how do we comply with the Resource Converse, Converse, Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA? Uh, are we required to comply? How do we comply? How do you know what, what you know what hazardous waste is covered? Uh, EPA, you know, came to the conclusion that they'd have to figure out how to manage this uh, in healthcare facilities because the RICRA regulations were really intended to focus on manufacturing facilities where the facilities handled large quantities of a fairly uh, narrow group of chemicals that were hazardous waste. Uh, healthcare facilities, by contrast, tend to have to generate a fair number, you know, a, a broad range of hazardous waste, but in fairly small quantities. And so EPA decided it was time to regulate. But they did a fairly comprehensive job of talking to industry, both in, you know, facility-based industries. And I know many of you have probably hosted a EPA uh, site visit or have been involved in meetings with the EPA. And I think EPA went out of their way to kind of uh, make sure that they uh, just got an understanding of how our uh, our system works, especially in long-term care. So and that's and that's kind of reflected in the uh, um, in the final rule. The final rule was published in February of this year, and it, be it becomes effective on August 19th. So there's not a whole lot of time. But the good news is that this rule, I think, anybody who's looked at it carefully will, will I think, can determine. There's, there are, free, are are few points of uh, confusion to which EPA confesses, but uh, it's not. It doesn't, you know, appear, I think, to, to be all that onerous, and I think that's the feedback I've gotten. We'll start with a few key definitions. As with any federal regulation, there are pages of uh, definitions that, you know, C or the, keep saying CMS, EPA goes through. But there are a few key ones that we have to understand. That, you know, they define pharmaceutical, um, and they define hazardous waste pharmaceutical, and that's important because, uh, there's a distinction between, uh, you know, a, a, a hazardous waste, whether it's accreditable or potentially non-creditable or potentially creditable. When this, this gets a little bit confusing, but these are terms that you're familiar with through your practice if you work in a pharmacy. And a potentially creditable uh, uh, waste is a prescription pharmaceutical that has a reasonable expectation to receive manufacturer's credit, and it has to be in the original manufacturer's package has to be undispensed, and it has to be unexpired or less than one year past expiration. Now, these are – now, you pay, maybe if you haven't read the rule yet, you may be wondering, you know, why are we talking potentially creditable versus non-creditable? Because the, the way we manage the, the, the drugs are, are going to be dependent upon whether they have the potential to receive credit from the manufacturer for uh, return and or reuse or whether they, whether they clearly are not creditable. So – uh, a non-creditable uh, hazardous waste pharmaceutical is a prescription drug that does not have a reasonable expectation to receive manufacturer's credit. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, patients who, you know, you have spitters, you have uh, packages that have been opened, uh, and there's no reasonable expectation that you're going to be able to receive a manufacturer's credit for it. Those are considered non-creditable, and a reverse distributor is a person or in in, in layman's terms, a company that receives and accumulates potentially creditable pharmaceuticals for facilitating credit. So a reverse distributor, distributor is that entity which, you know, we, we send uh, potentially creditable drugs off to, and they go through them and determine whether or not they're eligible for credit. So they're treated slightly differently in this, in this rule than the non-creditable drugs, drugs that are absolutely we can recognize as not having any potential for uh, re receiving uh, credit. Okay, so what facilities are subject to this rule? Now, you've spent some time and invested some, some, some time and energy in, in, uh, in worrying and looking at uh, uh, the, the EPA rule, but it turns out that in most cases, and, and I, again, depending upon the size of your pharmacy and the, and the amount of uh, prescriptions you process, um, you know, EPA estimates that uh, that probably relatively few 
of our facilities are actually subject to this rule through mandatory participation. But subjects to this rule are, um, from the EPA's uh, uh, explanation, are pharmacies, long-term care pharmacies, hospice, skilled facilities, and nursing facilities, but they specifically exclude not, not they, they, they specifically exclude assisted living and independent living. You know, so if you've got a CCRC that has an independent living or assisted living uh, division, those facilities are, they operate under the household waste rule. And many of you may remember the conversations we had with EPA about, uh, you know, the facility can't just go into an assisted living facility's uh, residence uh, uh, dwelling and confiscate their hazardous drugs, and so uh, EPA has decided that you know, assisted living residents and independent living residents are not going to be subject to the provisions of this rule and will be continue to be, they will be covered under the household waste exemption. So we've, and for our purposes, we think of pharmacies, uh, skilled facilities, and nursing facilities. Now, pers now the but not all of these facilities are going to be subject to the to mandatory uh, participation or, or subjection to this rule. And if you are a very small quantity genera generator of hazardous pharmaceutical waste, which means not more than 100 kilograms of, of hazardous waste per month or not more than one kilogram of acute hazardous waste per month, you are not subject to mandatory participation in the subpart P regulations, which is what this rule uh, uh, promulgates. The only exception is sewering. You cannot sewer or pour down the drain uh, uh, hazardous waste pharmaceuticals regardless of whether you're a very small quantity generator or a large quantity generator or anything. So sewering becomes prohibited for hazardous waste pharmaceuticals in all facilities effective in uh, August of this, this year. Okay, so now, and I'm, I'm not, we'll see if this, this works as, as a way to explain this, but the, the rule creates a subpart P under the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 40, which is with environmental uh, regulations. Uh, part 266, subpart P. Now, this is sp specific uh, to the management of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals and healthcare facilities. And in order to comply, or in order to voluntarily, or or if you're required to to comply, to register as a subpart P regulated facility, you need to make a one-time notification to the EPA regional administrator. There's a form that you fill out, which essentially registers you as a, uh, a site that's being regulated under subpart P. It's a one-time notification. You have to keep that, that uh, notification retained. And a, there's a separate notification required for each facility. So if you, if you have several pharmacies in your organization uh, you, and you want to be regulated under subpart P, you need to have a separate notification for each, a, each pharmacy. More about that later. Okay, so now first we'll sort of explain that there are two classes here that we have to, that there are management standards for. And the first, which is the little bit more comprehensive and a little bit more regulatory, is our non-creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste, which you remember are the ones that we can't reasonably expect any kind of credit for when we return. So we cannot, ex these are, these are uh, drugs that are clearly not going to be um, uh, accepted for waste uh, for for any kind of credit, and again, let me let me back up before because um, there have been a lot of questions about you know what is a hazardous pharmaceutical waste? You know which drugs are we talking about? EPA spends a fair amount of uh, ink or pixels in trying to explain to us. You know they they refer to to certain uh, segments of the hazardous waste regulations to point out which chemicals specifically are hazardous waste and how they're determined and whether they're acute or whether they're P or, or U-listed waste. There is no comprehensive government 
sanctioned public list of, uh, of hazardous pharmaceutical waste. But most of the drugs, I think, you know, from, from what I've been advised and, uh, and can read, are you know, the, the highest number are probably chemotherapy drugs. But there are a number of drugs. I mean, you're familiar with Coumadin, uh, physostigmine. Those kind of drugs are considered examples of hazardous pharmaceutical waste. Uh, but we don't have CMS or EPA does not give us a comprehensive listing to say these are all of the drugs that have to be managed. So, you know, I think maybe whether NCPA and ASCP can work with the uh, Health Distributors Association or, or some other entity to provide us a, a, a comprehensive list, or you can get a comprehensive list from your waste hauler. But that's one of the frustrations here is that there is no definitive comprehensive list of uh, hazardous pharmaceuticals that that are subject to the, the EPA's jurisdiction here. So back to managing non-creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste, um, you can either determine whether or not a drug is a ha hazardous waste, and that's, again, CMS or EPA outlines how you would do that, but they offer an alternative, which they really encourage, is that that EPA wants us to treat all non-creditable drugs as hazardous. So if you start a, a uh, collection for non-creditable hazardous drugs and you want to throw drugs in there, you know, drugs that, are, that you can't get credit for that are clearly non-hazardous, EPA says, fine, we encourage you to do that. The reason they do that is they don't want, they're trying to, to really reduce the number of drugs that get, thrown down the drain or thrown down the toilet. So they're actually encouraging pharmacies and healthcare facilities to commingle uh, creditable, non-creditable you know, non hazardous drugs with uh, non-creditable, non-hazardous drugs. Uh, for a non-creditable hazardous drug, remember these are the ones that can't be evaluated. They're clearly not eligible for any kind of return credit. The container has to be structurally sound, compatible with the contents, and you know it should prevent leaks or spills under reasonably foreseeable conditions. So you know that's the way they define that. Uh, the container has to be labeled because these are hazardous waste pharmaceuticals, and they have to be uh, labeled as such. So whatever container you use to manage non-creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste has to be has to be labeled with that uh, label, and the facility has one year uh, of accumulation time. So the first time a, uh, you take an empty container and in deposit a hazardous waste pharmaceutical, the clock begins to tick, and by the time, you know, 365 days later, that has to be transported off-site through the uh, re required methodology, which we'll come to in a bit. Okay, there's, there's another provision in here called compliance with land disposal restrictions. There are some hazardous waste pharmaceuticals that um, can't be, you know, the residue can't be placed in landfills, primarily because they contain heavy, heavy metals and they're not compatible with landfill regulations. Um, again, most of these are uh, heavy metal type uh, drugs, probably, uh, a fair number of them are uh, chemotherapy drugs, but these compounds have to be segregated in a separate container from other non-credible waste. And the, the idea is that the, because most of these non-creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste drugs are going to be incinerated, and incineration does not render these uh, uh, these other drugs with heavy metals harmless. So you're going to have to make that exception there. Okay, record keeping requirements. It wouldn't be a regulation unless there were unless there were record keeping requirements. And there's when you ship these drugs off to a uh, treatment storage and disposal facility, which is where they go from your from your facility, they, the uh, hazardous waste manifest has to be maintained for three years. If you do not get a, a signed copy that the manifest that the uh, from the manifest transporter, for the, or excuse me, signed copy of the manifest from the transporter within the 60 days of the date when the waste was accepted, you have to file an exception report, and that has to be maintained for three years. 
if you've done any sort of hazardous waste uh, testing, records of those have to be maintained for three years unless you have commingled non-credible, non-hazardous waste in with that, and then there's no requirement to maintain uh, any records of hazardous waste testing. Um, and if you're the subject of any kind of an enforcement action, uh, the ret retention periods are, are automatically extended. Okay, now here's the, here's the question that many of us were going to have is, all right, you're the pharmacy that, that manages uh, uh, the, drug, you know, the drugs for you know, several nursing facilities. The, the question arises, can you as a pharmacy manage the hazardous waste uh, uh, hazardous pharmaceutical waste from one of the facilities that you uh, that is a client facility for you. So if you have a if you have a relationship with a nursing facility, can does the APA allow you to manage their hazardous waste? The answer is yes, and um, but it's under certain conditions. These are spelled out in the final rule. But the sending facility, which would be the nursing home, and the receiving facility. Under, under, or under the same ownership, or if the sending facility, the nursing home, has an agreement uh, with the receiving facility, the pharmacy, to supply prescription drugs. So you, you can't have a, a casual relationship. If you are the pharmacy supplier to a nursing home, you have a, or, or, you're, or the nursing, nursing home and the pharmacy are owned by the same entity, then that's allowable. Um, the sending facility, which is the nurse, nursing facility, is operated under subpart B, which means they filed that form with the EPA saying they want to be regulated under subpart B. Um, the receiving facility has to manage the hazardous waste pharmaceuticals it receives under subpart B, so the, the, the receiving facility has to be uh, registered with EPA as well as being uh, managed under subpart B. And the receiving facility or the pharmacy has to keep records of all shipments of waste it receives from the nursing facility for three years. So those are the requirements if you want to uh, be compliant with uh, subpart P. Okay, now this will be mercifully much shorter. Uh, managing potentially creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste, the 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 the, the uh, EPA technically does not consider potentially creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste, a hazardous waste because it has not yet been determined to be uh, a waste until uh, a reverse distributor evaluates it, and then after that it will be considered a waste. So the, so the management of a potentially creditable hazardous pharmaceutical is uh, a lot more lenient than the non-creditable version of hazardous waste. So um, again, EPA would like pharmacies to treat all potentially credible drugs as hazardous, which means you can co-mingle them. They encourage you to co-mingle them, keep them in the same container. If they're going back to a reverse distributor and the same reverse distributor, just keep them in the same container, ship them back to the, uh, to the uh, reverse distributor and let them sort it out. And that means there's going to be a lot less uh, regulation and record keeping, but the co-mingled waste will be subject to all of subpart B. There's no container standards. See, uh, EPA has said, you know, we're not going to uh, come up with container standards uh, for non-potentially creditable hazardous pharmaceuticals because, um, you know, we have not determined that they're waste yet. Uh, there's, again, no accumulation time limit. You can keep them uh, for longer than a year or until the container gets full, and, there's, and the EPA is not going to uh, cite you for any of that. Uh, delivery confirmations have to be maintained for three years, and shipping papers for three years. Those are the ones, those are the record-keeping requirements under potentially creditable hazardous pharmaceutical waste. So if you can separate in your mind the difference between a, 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 a non-creditable waste, which has no chance of being ever credited to you for uh, return credit or a, or a potentially creditable waste, which does, the, the, the management standards are similar, but the potentially credible hazardous uh, treatment or management standards are a lot less uh, uh, complicated. 
Okay, now it comes to the whole issue of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals that are also DEA-controlled substances. Um, most long-term care facilities, according to EPA, they consider that roughly 98% of all nursing homes are very small quantity generators. Um, they can dispose of patient, you know, resident waste in DEA authorized collection receptacles. The receptacle must be on site, um, but that you can't dispose of uh, personal protective equipment or clean up residues in any of these receptacles. So we're going to we're going to uh, cover more of this in the next couple of slides. Um, but this is a big this is a big one. I mean, this again is is sewering is prohibited. We know that many nursing facilities probably have uh, on site destroyed of uh, controlled substances through sewering, and that's still that's still not prohibited by DEA as far as I know. But it's it's uh, but if it's a hazardous uh, waste pharmaceutical that also happens to be a DEA controlled substance, it, it can't be. It can't be tossed down the drain or in the toilet. So that that's uh, that's is a uh, a major provision. It applies uh, without exception. Okay, for in, in long-term care facilities, as, uh, EPA specifically address waste that are DEA controlled substances, and they talk specifically about long-term care facilities. And again, most nursing homes are going to be the vast majority of nursing homes are going to be exempt from uh, regulation by EPA, except for the prohibition on sewering. Um, and under the DEA regulations, facilities have the option of returning hazardous waste control drugs to long-term care pharmacy under the provisions of DEA regulations. They're not under the provisions of, of uh, uh, EPA. They're under the DEA regulations. Many of you recall when the DEA regulations on managing uh, uh, the disposing of controlled substances uh, was finalized in 2014. Uh, we, we were extensively involved in, in uh, discussions with DEA, and uh, we, we did a lot of work on, on implementation. But it's not really a super easy process because the pharmacy has to be much more intimately involved with the process than, uh, than uh, simple EPA regulations turn out to be. Um, and the long-term care facility under the DEA regulations can place, you know, they can dispose of uh, resident-controlled drugs through the DEA process, but they can't, uh, they can't dispose of facility inventory under the EPA processes. The end is in sight, so don't worry. We're almost there. Um, the final, you know, section here that, that you need to be concerned about is what about uh, residue in containers like, uh, you know, uh, pill containers, syringes, IV bags, aerosol cans. Uh, EPA covers that in a, in a separate section. And they've been fairly, I think, and most people have told me they think these are pretty reasonable. For stock dispensing or unit dose containers, if the, if the pills have been removed, they are considered empty and they're no longer hazardous. For syringes, if the syringe has, if the plunger has been fully depressed, um, they consider that to be essentially uh, empty and not and no longer hazardous. If a non-empty syringe containing a hazardous waste pharmaceutical, uh, if it hasn't been, if, if the plunger hasn't been fully administered or fully depressed or fully you know depressed, then it has to be managed as a non-credible hazardous waste. So think about these things. There's a couple of more slides here. IV bags, an IV bag is considered empty, and the residues are not regulated as hazardous waste if they've been fully administered to the patient. If they have been fully administered, if they have not been fully administered, and the IV bag did not contain acute hazardous waste, or in the other way of saying it, if it held non-acute hazardous waste, then the IV bag can be shown to be empty and the remaining residues are not regulated as hazardous waste, so we don't have to put those in any particular container. Or if an IV, IV bag is not empty through either of these two processes, and, and, and so it's, it hasn't been fully administered or, and, it has, and it is an acute hazardous waste, then it has to be managed as a non-creditable hazardous waste pharmaceutical through the process that, that uh, EPA has outlined in the past. 
Um, and then other containers like, you know, tubes and cans and air inhalers and nebulizers. Um, the safest thing is unless you can visibly determine that these are empty, you're, the, the, I think the, the, the EPA recommendation would be to just manage them as non creditable hazardous wastes. Uh, and that would be the, the way to go. Let me just see if, okay, these are the, uh, this is the last slide, and this, this is a summary here before we get on to q and I know I'm, I'm over time already. So um, the rule becomes effective on August 19th. Uh, for most of us, participation in subpart P is optional, except for the no sewering provision. You have to register with the EPA, there are two management classes, the non-creditable and the potentially creditable. Uh, long-term care pharmacies may manage waste for long-term care facilities as long as they properly uh, go through the paperwork uh, exercise with EPA. There are record-keeping requirements. Um, there are separate provisions for hazardous controlled substances and container residues. So um, I think um, that probably is, you know, we've hit the high point, so uh, I will turn it over to uh, our moderator, and we can, if we have any time left, we'll go for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul, um, and thank you, Dana and Paul, again, for being our speakers on this webinar. I think it was a, a great program. Dana and Paul, if you guys have a few minutes, uh, I think we've got quite a few questions in the chat box. Um, do you all have a couple minutes to answer a few questions? Yeah, I'd love sure. to. Awesome. Dane, is there any that um, that stand out to you since you've had a little more time to look at them? Uh, I see a trend. Um, one question, uh, someone had, had said that estrogen and progesterone were not on Category 2. They were in Group 3 because of the reproductive risk, but they really are in Category 2 because they are a reproductive risk, but they also are increased risk for cancer. So because estrogens and progesterones can cause testosterone uh, cancer, can also increase breast cancer, ovarian cancer, et cetera, that places them over into the, the uh, group two. So I just wanted to clarify that. And another question that was trending from a number of people was if they're in a retail setting and they have a technician that is dispensing a lot of, hazardous drugs, uh, do they need to wear everything? And I, if, as long as it is in cat the group two or three, you can determine that at a facility level what would be the appropriate protection for them to prevent exposure to the drug. If it is in group one, for, such as they are counting out methotrexate, they would need to be counting that out wearing double chemo gloves, a gown, and a mask to avoid any risk of exposure to methotrexate, according to the USP guidance. But if they are just doing other hazardous drugs, uh, if they just rarely dispense or count out the hazardous drugs, you may determine that they don't need to do anything. That as long as they don't manipulate the dosage formulation, they can count and pour it into the tablet uh, container, and that's fine. If they spend all day, and they do a lot of hazardous drugs, then you may decide that they should wear some or all of the suggested personal protective agreement. But it's totally up to the facility to write the standards for things in group two and three. And oh, I had a lot of people ask for this too. It is uh, the organization that has already developed some of these risk assessments is the College of Psychiatric and Neurological Pharmacists. It's cpnp.org. Not that I want to ring their bell, but it sure will speed things up. It's something that they have can help you get underway with your organization. Thank you. Paul, have you had a chance to check out some of the questions in the chat box? Well, there's, there, yeah, there's a, there's a few questions about fentanyl. And I think, you know, when I, when I was, was reading through this, fentanyl, I don't believe, is considered uh, a hazardous waste. And we know it's a controlled substance. But I, when I looked through the, the – I may be wrong about this if somebody has better information, but it was never listed as an uh, example of a hazardous waste pharmaceutical. So, and I know that, you know, so 
typically, I mean, I, I know that the, there's nursing facilities have have frequently flushed those down the toilet, and the EPA has limited the sewering prohibition only to drugs that are hazardous waste. So technically, they would like you not to do that, but the, the DEA regulations, and I think if, if you go back and look at the DEA regulations for compliance with management of controlled substances in healthcare facilities, especially long-term care facilities, if you if you want to comply with that, that that's reg, that's a relatively rigorous process because somebody from the pharmacy has to be there to manage the container and to take out the contents and and you know it, it's a fairly you know intensive thing. So you know to the extent that fentanyl's not considered, if if in fact I'm correct on this, and fentanyl's not considered under the EPA definition just to be a hazardous waste, then you know, sewering is not prohibited. I, I have um, another question here. I thought I would answer if I have a half a moment. Yeah. About when you're dispensing medications that are hazardous medications, do they all require a hazardous drug auxiliary label? The answer is yes. You do have a duty to document that that is a hazardous drug. There are OSHA requirements that we did not even touch on today, and OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, requires that we used to call them MDS, material data safety sheets. Now they're just called material data sheets. But those are supposed to be made available in your building if you have drugs that are on that list, but which most hazardous drugs are. And they are supposed to be sent with uh, at least the first time you dispense a drug to another healthcare setting. I, I don't think we follow that very well in pharmacy, at least in my 40 years of experience. I haven't seen that managed real well. But we have an obligation to notify downstream if there's a hazardous drug. You may choose not to enact any of USP 800 in your pharmacy, but your customers, if it's not someone's home, may be required to do so. So they need to be notified that it's a hazardous drug. So you should be putting that label on it. For at least for anything dispensed to a nursing home or other healthcare setting, you don't have to notify of a hazardous drug to the patient specifically because they are not mandated by USP 800 to do anything about it. However, from a policy perspective, if you have a product that you think could place a patient or their family member or their grandchildren at risk, like testosterone creams or estrogen creams that a child might come into contact with that could have negative consequences, then you have an obligation to notify about the hazard. So however you do it is up to you, but that notification is, is a duty of the pharmacy. Paula, I see several questions about subpart P. Uh, do you want to talk about that anymore? One says, for example, when, it, when would a facility register under subpart P? Uh, it becomes, you know, it's the CMA, or EPA does not say, you know, effective at what point you register. The rule becomes effective in uh, in August, but I'm, you know, they they've never they never said in the final rule when do you, you know, when can you register it to be managed under, you know, manage your facility under under subpart P. You know, like I'm going to check into that. I'll I'll see if you know what, at what point registration opens up for that. But uh, that's a good question. I saw another one here about uh, a empty bottle of warfarin. Whether that, how that has to be managed. And under the under the container regulations, EPA says that if it's empty, it doesn't have any pills in it. Even though you, there may be residual powder in there, they're going to consider that for purposes of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, they're going to consider that empty. So I know it. You know, it's uh, it, it may have powder or residue in there, but for purposes of the EPA, that is considered empty. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. I know we have quite a few questions that have come through that we haven't had an opportunity to answer. Um, would you guys be available if we kind of compiled those and sent those over? Maybe we could get some answers and send them out to the group? Absolutely. My pleasure. Yes, yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much.
Thank you, everyone, uh, who has been able to, to be on the call. We appreciate your time. Can I, um, can I just interject one quick yeah. thing here? I noticed this. Yeah. That this was part of the regulation. I forgot to mention it, but somebody asked a question about nicotine. EPA in this rule declared that nicotine, you know, smoking cessation uh, products, nicotine replacement patches are not going to be regulated as hazardous waste, so they can be disposed of, you know, without any kind of consequences. So that should have been in my probably one of my first slides, but it's that's the that's the answer to that question. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, thank you guys for being here today. Thank you to our participants for joining us, and for those of you who decided to stay for the Q&A um, that went past the hour, we appreciate your time. If any of your colleagues were not able to join us, uh, keep in mind we will make the same content available for a home study CE within the next week or so. Um, you guys should get information on how to um, share that information for the home study CE. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and um, you know, happy to, to get you guys in touch with ASCP as well. So thank you guys so much for your time, and have a great afternoon.